Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Verse 36, and when, listen to this, when Paul has said, he said, when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more, and they accompanied him unto the ship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what we just read right now is known as Paul's farewell message. And the Bible says that in Ephesians, he called the elders of the church, and they met him in the beach because it was a time where he was going to depart in the ship. And as they met him, he began to share this with them. And he went down through all the things that he had been through with them for three years. And in verse 28, he tells them, and he talks to them directly, and he says, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock. In other words, to the church. Then he says, Which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, elders, pastors, leaders. And then he said, Why did he make them overseers? To feed. God's church, to feed the church of God. And then he makes it clear that the church does not belong to Paul or to the elders, he says, which he, talking about Christ, hath purchased with his own blood. And I would love for us to see this this morning in the book of Acts and to study it. And if you get a chance when you get home, you'll have the opportunity to study this also. The last farewell message of the Apostle Paul as he addresses the church in this area. But I, I want you to understand something that there are four lasting impressions as I read this whole last message that Paul gave the church. There are four things that really stood out to me as I was reading Paul's message. And I want to point those out here. Number one, of Paul's personal connection with the church in that area. You see, in this passage, we encounter the Apostle Paul, as we said before, he's about to leave and departure after he had invested considerable time in nurturing and in the spiritual growth of the church in that area. We witness how deeply Paul had formed a spiritual connection with the membership and the elders in that area. We witness how important it is, not just for Paul, but for Paul to tell us also the same today, that as leaders in God's church, Paul is saying we have to have a personal connection with the people of God. There has to be no dividing wall that alienates leadership and laity. They must be all brought in together as one. Because at the end of the day, our purpose and our goal is to make heaven our home. Amen? The leader is not going to get there before the member or the member before the leader. We're going to try to get there together. And we're in the same boat, we're in the same team. And Paul is telling them as he gives them the farewell message, he's saying, look, I had a personal connection with you guys. He made it real clear to them that that wall, or that barrier that sometimes alienates leadership and the membership, Paul is saying that does not exist in my ministry. He said it should not exist in the ministry of God's church. That wall that separates it. But Paul is saying there must be a personal connection. That's number one that stands out for me. Number two, we see of Paul's spiritual guidance. What does that mean? Even in, his, even in his farewell address, Paul exemplifies the same characteristic, the same style. As you're reading it, you, you notice the style of Paul's writing. You notice, oh, this is Paul speaking here. And not only is he speaking about a, a personal connection, but at the same time, Paul knowing this may be the last message he's going to preach to the elders, he's trying to still give them spiritual guidance that will help them. Rather than imparting his own personal ideas, he entrusts the church with the responsibility, and he tells them, look, I'm leaving. Now you continue to stand firm in God's word. 
He emphasizes that the church's commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ is the solid foundation which will help her when opposition will arise in the future. He's preparing them for this. Paul firmly believed that if the church in this region remained spiritually strong, they would receive divine guidance and resilience, enabling them to perse uh, persevere through both favorable and adverse circumstances. What does that mean? That Paul was telling them, I'm leaving, but if you continue to stand firm on God's word, it doesn't matter what will come our way, this church will stand firm in God's word. It was Paul's assurance that their unwavering faithfulness would sustain them and keep them steadfast in their journey. So this is just a few things that are popping out to me as I'm reading his farewell letter. First, his personal connection. Two, his spiritual guidance. And then he turns it around and he talks to them Number three, about becoming true shepherds. So first is his personal connection, then his spiritual guidance, and then Paul calls him to become true shepherds. Do we need true shepherds today? Amen. We do. Not just in, in this local church. We need them in every single church. True shepherds. What is a true shepherd? Paul implores to the church that they are to embrace the calling that they are shepherds under God's guidance. He emphasizes that their duty is beyond being an overseer of the flock, but they had been entrusted with the responsibility of safeguarding the children of God. Not just safeguarding them, but upholding the teachings of Jesus. So in other words, what is Paul saying to them? You've been called to provide spiritual nourishment to the church. And Paul is telling them, look, you've been called not just to shepherd the church, but to nourish the church, to give the church the food that they need. And what is the food that they needed was the sound doctrine of God's word. And then he says, but you've also been called to be protectors of the truth to guard against false teachings that had crept in even in Paul's time. All this that we see today, these new teachings and false teachings that come out today, they're just the same things that were taught, just covered up all over again. It's always the same thing. And you see that today in Paul exhibited it, and Paul's message is that he calls for these true shepherds in the church to be faithful to discharge their duties with what? With love, wisdom, and steadfast commitment. And we talked about it. It's amazing. As you write a message, you come to church and how God confirms those things. Sister Lisa was speaking in Sunday school about love. The ultimate factor in the message that we preach is love. And then our sisters sing about steadfastness. And Paul is saying here about love, wisdom, and steadfast commitment. So as I read the book of Acts, in this last farewell letter, I see that Paul's personal connection. I see his spiritual guidance. I see Paul's call to be a true shepherd. Number four, I see Paul's sacrificial service. If there's ever been a leader that we can point to other than Jesus of the sacrifice of leadership, it's Paul. Just read his life. Got in a ship, the ship broke. Got away from the ship into land, a snake bites him. Even from the beginning, what happened? He's going to Damascus, thinking he has a job to do, falls on the floor, gets up, can't see. I'm talking, you're talking about a man that has been through a lot, sacrificing everything for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if Paul was here today, you know what they do? They kick him out of the churches. If he was here today. They say, oh, you're too strict. Paul is a, a leader, a, 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 an example for us of what a leader is to lead with devotion. His words are unwavering in his conviction. 
You remember back in the days when, when people would say yes, it meant yes? <laughs> we didn't have to sign nothing, they'd just shake hands, and you knew that the deal was done, and they were going to be men and women of their word? That was the type of leader Paul was. And Paul is telling them the same way. He said, look, the way I conducted myself, you must conduct yourself also as leaders in God's church. His words were, were resounding. Paul earnestly encouraged them to emulate his example. Can you imagine? He knew his walk with God was the best it could be that Paul had the guts to say, follow me as I follow Christ. Can you imagine getting to that point spiritually to tell others, follow me as I follow Christ? He knew that his life was an example. He emphasized that the role of a leader extends beyond being served by the people. Now, you're not going to hear that a lot today from a lot of leadership, not just in churches, but also in, the, in politics, in government, in, in, in corporations. What is Paul saying here? That a leader is not called to be served, but he's called to serve. Plain and simple. You want to reach the highest pinnacle of, of leadership in church? Then you have to be the best Serving in the church. <laughs> and if the bathroom is dirty, you go and clean the bathroom. It don't matter if you reach the highest level, the highest level. Jesus said, if you want to be the best, you're going to have to be the best servant. That's leadership that Paul is exemplifying to them. He said, that's sacrificial leadership. Do you see that today? Very rare do we see it today. Very rare. Not just in church or in the religious sector and corporations and everywhere. When, when a man or woman reaches that level, automatically they think that they are to be served. No, you are to serve the rest. So we see sacrificial service. And he underscores the importance of leaders humbly embracing their responsibility to serve others. Following in the footsteps of who? Of Jesus. Jesus said, if I knelt down and washed your feet, do as I do. And, and, and what happens sometimes? Oh, well, that was just Jesus giving us an illustration. No, Jesus said, do as I do. What did he tell Peter? He said, Peter, I want to wash your feet. Peter said, no, no, don't wash my feet. He said, well. And then after they had a conversation, he says, Peter, look, if if, if if you don't do or you don't obey what I'm telling you, you won't have part with me. And Peter was like, all right, not just my feet. <laughs> oh, I don't think he quite understood at that moment what he was trying to say. But it, what he was trying to say is, Peter, look, there's going to be situations in my word, what I'm telling you, what I'm teaching you that you may not understand right now, but do them by faith and obedience to me. And you'll see the outcome. When you're faithful to God. God is faithful. Amen? But you're faithful not expecting that because you're not doing, oh, I'm going to be faithful so he'll be faithful. No, you're doing it out of love to God that you're faithful. And everything will, what does the Bible say? Seek first the kingdom of God and everything will fall in place. And Paul is talking to the elders and he's about to die but there's peace. And then he also tells them, last but not least, to remain steadfast and firm. So he, he witnesses to the elders who are being touched, and he tells them to stand committed to God's word no matter what circumstances they're going to face. Who better than to tell them this than Paul, who knew that he was going to die real soon. But one time Paul said, I finished my course. I've done the best that I can. I'm ready to go home. You know, there's an assurance in a person that has Christ in his heart that when death comes knocking in the door, you're ready to go. And you say, Lord, I'm ready. 
And as you read, go with me to verse 18. We'll jump right back to verse 18. And when they were come in, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, and what manner I have been with you all at all seasons. Look at what verse 19 says. I like this. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. What does that mean? What does humility of mind mean here? It is the opposite of self-importance. It's the opposite of seeking to exalt himself. What is Paul saying? That he demonstrating a willingness to do what? As a leader, to learn from others. To serve others. To consider the needs of others. To look at the perspective of others and not think of himself superior than others. That's the leadership that Paul was telling us. It's an attitude that cultivates, what does it cultivate? A spirit of humility, openness, and of lack of self-centeredness. And the leader says, what can we do to move forward together? Instead of saying, you got to do what I tell you. No. What can we do to move forward? In verse 20 says, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. In other words, Paul is saying, I gave you every single thing that I know of God for these three. I poured it all out to you for these three years. You know, our first general overseer, A.J. Tomlinson, they called him the prevailer when he was in Bible college. And the reason was because all the students, it was a nickname they gave him because they knew that he prayed until he prevailed. And sometimes that prayer was a three-hour prayer. And he prayed for three until he felt, God, answer me. And he would get up and he said, oh, there goes the prevailer. And Paul is saying the same thing to them. Not just a commitment to God's word, but Paul is saying, look, I gave you everything that I had of the gospel message. Verse 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. We know because there was a prophecy that talked about Paul going bound. Not knowing the things that shall befall me there. And Paul is saying, I don't know what befalls me. Verse 23, say that the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But listen to verse 24. But none of these things move me. Can you imagine what he's saying? Neither count I my life dear unto me, unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. But Paul says, none of these things move me. Face trials, persecution, opposition, and personal hardships. How many of us have faced that all our lives? How many of us may be facing that today? We may be facing that today. But Paul remained steadfast, determined in his mission to fulfill his calling. And he said, none of these things move me. He meant that external circumstances, negative experiences, or threats to his well-being did not discourage him or make him give up. You know why? Because his eyes were fixed on who? Jesus. And we talked about hurts today in Sunday school. And we can talk about that all the time. And, and you know what? That's not the only time we're, we're probably going to get hurt again. <laughs> and then we're probably going to get hurt again after that. But you know, you, you're going to get up from it and you're going to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and you're going to move forward. That's the only way to do it. You ask me how, how many times you've been hurt, Brother Nathan. Hundreds of times. How many times has leadership uh, failed you? Lots of times. I've been through situations where I didn't, have, I didn't want to share with my wife to discourage her spiritual walk. But you know what? I'm still standing. And you know what? I love those men and women because they have a soul. And I don't desire not even the enemies to go to hell and experience that. And Paul is saying here, none of these things move me. Then he warns them in verse 28. 
Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. And he tells him to do what? Feed God's church. Give the church the nourishment it needs. Don't give them your ideas. Don't give them your opinions. Don't say the Lord told me to tell you this when the Lord ain't told you nothing. <laughs> a lot of that going on around today, right? God told me to tell you. Did he really tell you this? And then when it doesn't happen, the Bible says if you prophesy, you say something don't happen, then you're a false prophet. Oh, well, somebody once said, well, the prophet did, didn't occur because it's, it's a conditional prophecy based on the person that it's given to. Well, the Bible don't teach that. If you say God told you and it didn't happen and God really didn't tell you, then I'm going to question everything you're telling me. Might as well just tell people, let's see what the Bible says. They come to you with, let's see what God's word says. That's what Paul is saying when he's saying to feed the church of God. But then he tells him this, and if I was part of the group of the elders, you know we're human. He says them in verse 30, also of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things. I imagine some of them looked at each other like, uh-oh. And he sells them. And they're going to draw away disciples after them. But then Paul says, watch and remember that in these three years I cease not to warn everyone. And then he says, how did I warn you? Night and day with tears. He taught them. Paul was a long-winded minister. I know sometimes we go over to the 30 minutes and we get all over, oh man. The importance of what? Guarding the church against false doctrine. We're almost to the end. Verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. Not Paul's grace, not Paul's life, but what does he say? It's the word of His grace. Whose word? God's word is able to do what? To build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Which means what? Those that have been separated for God's service. And then listen to what Paul says in verse 33. I, I love this here. Paul says, I coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. In other words, he said, I, I didn't want to be the best or have the best. And then he says in verse 34, Yea, you yourself know that these hands, and I imagine when Paul speaking to him, he's saying, look, these hands have ministered unto my necessity. He was a tent maker. And what did Paul do? The Bible says that when he would go to a town to preach, he would automatically begin to build tents to raise funds for himself, not to be a what? A burden to the church. What an example of leadership. What an example of a man to, to say, the, my own hands, I work my own hands to minister to my needs to do what? To, and to them that were with me. Why? Because he said, I don't want to be a burden to you guys. Now, he says in verse 35, I've showed you all things, how that so laboring, you ought to support the weak. Man, this, this is a, a message totally different from what's being taught today. Right? Listen to what he says. You ought to support the weak. Remember the words of Jesus, how he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I know that we've been in that situation. You ever felt good when you just were able to help somebody? It feels good. There's something in our human nature. Even those that don't profess Jesus as Lord, there's something in their human nature that tells them it feels good just to give to others and to help others. And then Paul says his farewell in verse 36. Read it with me. So after Paul's done talking, he stops. Just, ima just, just imagine with me, Paul stops. And when he had thus spoken, this is so beautiful. Paul kneeled down and all the brethren around him. And you know what? Look, they kneel all together, kneel down, and they began to pray. Can you imagine what was going in the mind of the elders at that time, knowing that this was probably the last time they were ever, ever going to see Paul? Can you imagine some of them must have said, I don't know if, if that young man that fell was an elder. I don't know. 
Imagine him was to say, I should have not fell asleep that night. I would have got some good teaching. Now he's leaving and <laughs> what's going to happen now? But they nailed down and the Bible says, and listen to, we're reading from the King James. So remember, the King James is a literal translation. So it says, and they were, and they all wept sore. That's a deep type of weeping. That's almost like if they're grieving the death of somebody. You ever seen somebody grieve so much that their, 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 uh, their tears or their weeping is uncontrollable? That they even have to like grasp for air? That's the type of weeping that took place because they knew Paul is leaving us. Paul is leaving. And a writer once said, never again has there been another Paul in this world. Never again. Willing to do everything to give his life. And you know, he had to continue to prove himself throughout his ministry because of who he was before. Even in the church, they made fun of him. And he said, oh, is this is this the one that looks all great and mighty in his letters, but when he gets up here to speak, he can't even speak in public? And Paul said, I know you guys make fun of me because I can't speak in public. It's in the Bible, read it. That's how they described him. He's the same one that was in prison, and he tells Timothy and Titus, and he said, hey, bring, bring my sweater. And then he says, but look, I'm going to tell you something. I'm here alone, and everybody has abandoned me. After he gave everything to the church, he finds himself totally abandoned and even named some brothers that had turned back to the world and betrayed Paul. But in all of this, Paul says, this don't move me. Because <laughs> he said, my eyes are fixed on God. Amen. And that's, that's just not my personal hope. That's a hope for each one of us. That our home of reunion will be heaven one day. Verse 37, And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all the words he spake, and they should see his face no more. Can you imagine Paul getting on a ship and waving to them? And that was the last wave they ever saw. But then can you imagine when they made it to heaven and they see that wave again and Paul says, hey, I'm back. <laughs> it, just, it just brings tears to my eyes to read this last farewell of Paul. And we're all going to experience that. But Paul says, towards the end when he, when he talks to them, he encouraged them that no matter what would come, to stand firm on God's word. 